Charlotte and Mary went down Broadway, and outside the theater were people waiting to get in. And then she went back on another week, and she saw another picture by Mr. Zuckor's company, and there was nobody outside. And Charlotte and Mary had long talks about why was it that her pictures got such crowds and other people's didn't. So very sweetly, she brought the question up with Mr. Zukor. Zukor's distribution company was Paramount Pictures. She requested Zukor to open up his books, and she reviewed all the receipts of all the Paramount Pictures, and she concluded that the other films were really being sold on the coattails of her films. The studio would say to the exhibitor, you can have this Mary Pickford, but you have to take these other five Paramount pictures too. And this rankled her. Pickford saw that her films powered Zucor's company, but she didn't share in the profits. Years of negotiating had made Mary and Charlotte skilled businesswomen. In 1916, it was time to renew her contract. Mary would sit there and be sorrowful about what she had to ask for, and it was a shame that it had to come to this. And Charlotte would do the grunt work, and Charlotte would be the muscle. But uh, Mary was perfectly capable of playing the muscle, too. <laughs> the deal made national news. When she first signed with Zucor, Mary earned $25,000 a year. With this deal, just three years later, she was paid $500,000. She got her own production unit, where she shared creative control with Zucor. He set up a separate company to distribute her films, and they shared the profits. She took a few perks as well. A secretary, a press agent, and $40,000 for the time spent negotiating. Adolf Zukor met his match, and he freely admitted it and always paid tribute to her, saying, had she not been a movie star, she would have been the head of the United States Steel Corporation. In 1917, Pickford was 24. She was one of just two international superstars. Charlie Chaplin was the little tramp. She was America's sweetheart. From California to England and Japan, more than 12 million people watched her films every day of the year. Everyone felt that they knew and owned and loved their little Mary. Stardom is partly about acting, partly about looks, but mostly about audience identification. About the audience somehow believing in this actor, actress as the person they are playing, that that is who they are. She told a fan magazine, people consider me their personal friend. They not only want me to be, but expect me to be, in real life, exactly what I am in the pictures. And the concept of stardom didn't really yet exist in the way we know it today. No one yet knew what it was, including her. Success and Zucor drove her to take on a staggering workload at least five full-length pictures a year. It was hard for her to relax, because as far back, basically, she could remember from the time she was six or seven, she had had this oppressive responsibility loaded on, that it all rested on her shoulders. To add to the pressure, she had to hide the fact that her personal life was miserable. Owen Moore was a violent, abusive, alcoholic husband who only had criticism and derision in his words toward Mary. She would stay apart for, say, a week or two or a month, and then they would try to get back together, and back and forth and back and forth. In 
January 1917, after a bitter fight with Owen, she was alone in her hotel room. At 25, she was suffocating in her marriage and exhausted by the unending marathon of work. She leaned out the window, transfixed by the pavement below. She pulled herself back and called the one person she could trust, her mother. Charlotte decided Mary should no longer see Owen. Within days, they set off to make her next film in Los Angeles. But Mary could no longer escape her feelings through work. She was in love with another man. Douglas Fairbanks was a talented, flamboyant Broadway actor. They had met two years before at a party. A group went for a walk in the woods. As she tried to cross a stream, Mary paused. Douglas saw her hesitation. Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford clicked immediately. I think the major reason is that he wasn't afraid of her. He had a very healthy ego. He was funny, he was vibrant, he lit up the room when he came in, he didn't drink. All these things put him in direct, stark contrast to Owen Moore. Douglas was fast rising to stardom, making breezy comedies and swashbuckling adventures. His strength and athleticism delighted audiences and Mary. She'd never been around an exuberant, larger-than-life man. Mary's sense of the world was as something to hide from. Douglas's sense of the world was as a, as a wonderful oyster, and it was all his, and it was all there for the taking. But both of them were married, and he had a young son. Not only was divorce totally unacceptable by most of society at that time, they both had these careers that were completely dependent on public support. So the agony was, if we get a divorce, we'll probably lose our careers. One night, Douglas asked Mary to go for a drive in New York Central Park. His mother had just died. As he drove, he talked about her death and began to cry. A few minutes later, Mary noticed that the clock in the car had stopped. They took it to mean that somehow his mother sanctioned their feelings. From then on, they used the phrase, by the clock, as a private reference to their love. <laughs> 